Good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing this morning? We good? Are we all ready for Christmas? Yeah, yeah okay, some yeah, yes, no's, some maybes. Hate to break it to you, but it, it'll be here in a week whether we like it or not. Maybe that gets you excited. Maybe that stresses you out a little bit. I had a buddy post this on Facebook the other day. Now, first, this is funny because he clearly hasn't done the iPhone update that changes, uh, that fixes the glitch where it changes the uh, a capital I into an A and the weird question mark in a box thing. The update has been out for like a month, dude. Come on, update your, update your phone. But aside from that, I can kind of relate to this post. I can kind of relate to the sentiment. I feel like Christmas has kind of snuck up on me this year. We had a pretty busy end of November, beginning of December, and all of a sudden, today's December 17th. I don't feel like I've had an adequate amount of time to get into the Christmas spirit. I had every intention of getting into the Christmas spirit, but life happens and plans change and priorities change, right? But this is the last week of our Christmas series, the culmination of the four weeks exploring how we can experience and engage in God's heavenly world right here, right now. This should be the most Christmassy of Christmas messages, right? It'd be a shame if I were up here right now and not in the Christmas spirit. Let's see if we can remedy that situation. Brought a couple things with me this morning to try and force me into the Christmas spirit. Be right back. Okay. All right. Starting to feel it now. Yeah, exactly. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Got my ugly Christmas sweater on, celebrating the birthday boy. Got my Marty Moose mug, as popularized by the timeless classic Christmas Vacation. <sighs> Eggnog. Easily one of the top three types of nog. So while my birthday boy sweater and my moose mug might be my preferred way of getting into the holiday spirit, the Christmas spirit, there are other things people like to do as well. Maybe for you, it's setting up your Christmas tree. Maybe it's hanging the lights outside. Maybe it's going out and shopping for gifts for your loved ones. Maybe it's that day after Thanksgiving when you can confidently listen to all the Christmas music you want without feeling any fear of scrutiny. Now, on the topic of that last one, I've got a surprising little bit of trivia for you. If you've ever met me, if you've had even just one conversation with me, heck, if you even have just observed me from afar, it's not that hard to find out that I love music with every ounce of my being. But, to be honest, I don't really love Christmas music. I mean, I don't really hate it either, but I definitely don't understand why some people get so freaking excited when they can finally listen to Christmas music 24 seven. Just doesn't really make sense to me. Sure, I enjoy a handful of traditional hymns and some of the normal carols. Everybody loves Bing Crosby singing White Christmas or Nat King Cole singing the Christmas song. You know, the one chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Apparently that's just called the Christmas song. Very creative, Nat. Um, but I feel as time goes on, we hear their good renditions of songs less and less in favor of significantly lesser songs like say, oh, I don't know, Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas is You, which apparently someone felt the need to make an animated film of that based on that song this year. Why? Why is that something that needs to exist? There's also something that exists by Justin Bieber, a song called Mistletoe, apparently. Uh, I can't say um, that I have ever even heard a note, and if I have, it was completely by accident. <laughs> okay, so I guess I'm kind of working, you guys are helping me work through my Christmas music therapy session this morning, listening to me talk about it. Um, and as I do, I kind of feel Okay, so maybe my issue is actually not with all Christmas music, just the cheesy pop Christmas songs. The kinds that are three chords and simple and sugary sweet and written to the lowest common denominator. And there was one song, one song to me, that is the cheesiest cheese of all Christmas songs. The moon is right, the spirit's up, we're here tonight. And that's enough Simply having A wonderful Christmas time Simply having A wonderful Christmas time 
Paul McCartney's Wonderful Christmas Time. <laughs> oh man, it's so bad. It's infuriating enough because it's a bad and annoying song. But lest we not forget, that man was a beetle. <laughs> How in the world is the man who wrote Let It Be and Hey Jude also capable of writing that steaming pile? <laughs> I mean, sure, I'd expecting, expect something like that from Ringo, maybe. But Sir Paul, no. We live in a dark and broken world, my friends. <laughs> I feel like I have to take off my Christmas sweater now and put away my moose mug because I've just undone any and all good Christmas will that I have built up after listening to that song. Nothing takes me out of the festive mood faster than wonderful Christmas time. And I think that's why I'm bothered by it so much. In virtually any other circumstance, Music is a life-giving source to me. It energizes me. It fills my soul. God has taught me more about him and myself through everything from the Beatles to Pearl Jam to Need to Breathe to the Killers and everything in between. But Christmas music, the music that's supposed to be inspired by the birth of his son, Jesus, so often falls flat to me. Christmas, after all, is supposed to be this thinnest place of all. God choosing to become human and walk the earth and bridge the gap between us and him, and for him to be with us. While it may not be cheesy Christmas music, I'd be willing to hedge a bet that I'm not the only one here in this room this morning that has things in their lives that keep them from truly rejoicing and being with Christ in this thin place of Christmas. Maybe the thought of spending time with your family really stresses you out this time of year. Maybe financial constraints make it hard to buy gifts for your kids or your family, and it makes it hard to get excited about Christmas when you fear you will be disappointing somebody. Maybe you've lost a loved one this year, or you're still missing your grandpa or your sister or your dad who's been gone for years, and it can make your white Christmas turn into a blue Christmas. Maybe we have the best intentions of getting into the Christmas spirit for all the right reasons. We plan to draw closer to Jesus through this season, but life gets in the way and our plans change. Whatever it may be, God has plenty to say about where and how we can find joy and peace in the thinnest place of all, Jesus' birth. So when reading the accounts of Jesus' birth in the Gospels, this is, might sound weird, but I'm often a little too aware that it's a spiritual story. And what I mean by that is I'm very aware that this is God's story, and I'm often too detached from the fact that these were real people dealing with real situations, just like you and me. Yes, I know this, but I don't often allow myself to understand this. So in my reading of the Gospels recently, one of my favorite things about the Christmas story is how it's filled with so many normal life circumstances. I think it's a pretty universal life truth that life doesn't always go the way you plan. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, you have lived a very fortunate life. It's just a fact of life, really, that we plan and we plan and we very rarely see things turn out exactly the way we planned. It was no different for Mary and Joseph. They've been dealing with more than their share of changing plans. I'm sure we all know the story, right? Mary and Joseph were engaged to be married. There was no doubt excitement about the upcoming marriage, and they were in the midst of planning their traditional wedding of the time, but plans changed. Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is a mighty big wrench to throw into their plans. So Joseph decides to adjust his plans. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. Joseph decides to do as honorable of a thing as he can think of, just break the engagement quietly. But God had other plans, and he sent an angel to Joseph in a dream. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. So again, Joseph's plans changed. 
Now, we don't get many details about Mary and Joseph's wedding, really none at all. You know, how many bridesmaids did Mary have? Was there a vegetarian option at the reception? Did they have a band or a DJ? Uh, culturally speaking, a wedding like this would have been a large celebration involving the whole village that they lived in. However, considering the circumstances, I wonder if it was a smaller ceremony, you know, family and maybe a few close friends away from the staring glances and the gossip that would have been surrounding their marriage. These aren't necessarily hugely important details to the story, but I think people's stories are fascinating. So you're stuck with me wondering and pondering some of these things up here this morning. But I think when we ask these questions, it brings more humanity to the story as well. So like the wedding, we also virtually know no details about the nine months of Mary's pregnancy. How bad was the morning sickness? Like, is it significantly worse because she's giving birth to God? Or is it like you just kind of chilled that out for her a little bit? You know, you're going through enough. You won't have much morning sickness. Did she have any weird cravings? I don't know. Mary, hey, Joseph, can you go pick me up some pickles and ice cream? Joseph, what's a pickle? What's ice cream? <laughs> The next thing we know, really, after the beginning of the story, is that Mary is very near to giving birth. They're probably preparing their home for the arrival of their baby. They may even have their own birth plan. But more changes come along. At, the at that time, Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that the census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius uh, was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, who was now expecting a child. I am sure Mary was thrilled about this. Ask any of the moms here at DR what was on their list of things they wanted to do when they were nine months pregnant, and I think the list would look something like this. At number one, you got, get this baby out of me. At number two, probably nap. Then a bunch of other stuff. And then somewhere around 1001, you'd probably have travel via modern convenience. And then you'd have a whole bunch of other stuff, and somewhere down around 4,002 on their list of things they want to do is travel via donkey. <laughs> but Mary and Joseph didn't have a choice, and they had to change their plans and go. And this isn't some sort of short trip across town or to a neighboring town. According to the almighty Google, it would take approximately 33 hours to walk from Nazareth to Bethlehem. That would be like me walking from my house in Northwest Tucson to downtown Phoenix. That would, um, I know modern conveniences make Phoenix not seem like it's that far away, but is there anybody in this room that wants to walk from Tucson to Phoenix? I know that's not something I'd be super pumped about. And you think, you look at maps and like those countries and those towns are a lot closer together and Arizona's a big state that gives you an idea of, you know, how big Arizona actually is and how far away these towns were. And unlike the trip from Phoenix to Tucson where elevation drops slightly as you go, which may or may not make the trip a little easier if you were walking it, the elevation rises from Nazareth to Bethlehem and the terrain uh, changes a little bit. So that would probably make it a little more difficult as their journey went on. And 33 hours is if you just walk straight through, right? With battling the terrain, taking time to eat and rest, this was minimum a two-day trip, but we're probably looking more like a three- or four-day trip. And I imagine there were many times not only throughout this journey, but throughout the whole nine months of Mary's pregnancy, where Mary and Joseph wondered, like we often do when we're faced with uh, plans and circumstances that change, they wonder if all this inconvenience and change of plans, pain and discomfort was going to be worth it because it sure seemed like a lot to endure. Yes, Mary and Joseph were surely special people. But like I was saying earlier, it's easy for me to detach from this, even just a little bit, and forget that they would surely have been annoyed like me. They would surely get frustrated like me, and they would surely get upset like me. They were special and they were normal, just like us. 
Think about these normal people and the special, extraordinary things they experienced. They were both visited by angels. That is an amazing and miraculous occurrence. Very few people had truly been as close to the presence of God as Mary and Joseph were, having been face to face with one of God's angels. But think about the moments in your life when you've been closest to God. Maybe it was after a, a particularly amazing worship service some Sunday morning. Maybe it was after a retreat, weekend retreat that left you rejuvenated and re recharged. Maybe it was after an amazing night at small group. I know for me, I, the further I get away from those uh, certain types of spiritual highs, the harder it is for me to draw on them and keep them going and feel closer and connected to God. I wonder if as time passed, if Mary and Joseph found it hard to draw on those meetings with those angels and that amazing experience, they found it hard to do that to keep moving forward. But like we often do, they find a way to keep going in the face of challenging situations and changing plans. They finally reach Bethlehem. They're tired and worn down and wanting nothing more to rest from their journey. But Mary goes into labor and there is no place for them to go. They try, but there was no lodging available for them. Mary, at this point, was undoubtedly having to endure the pain and discomfort of contractions and rightfully focus on surviving each one of those as they happened. But if I had been Joseph, I would have been thinking to myself, you have got to be kidding me. What in the world is going on? Is anything going to go the way we planned it? What are we going to do now? Whether it was some quick thinking, maybe the kindness of a stranger, or just happening upon the place, they are able to settle in a stable. It isn't much. Heck, it's practically nothing, but it is something. Ask any of the parents here at DR, and they'll tell you that things get real when someone goes into labor. <laughs> There's definitely that moment of, oh crap, this is happening, like now, someone's gonna have a baby, there's gonna be a baby here, this is happening now, oh crap. And, but you have that moment, but then in that moment, all of your frustration and annoyance of what may or may not have gone on over the last nine months, what may have gone according to plan or not, all that goes out the window, because it's officially about something bigger than that now. It becomes about that moment and that baby getting here safe and healthy by whatever means that may entail. For Mary and Joseph, once the grunting and moaning and the pushing and pain was over, everything was different. God was no longer speaking through angels. God was no longer distant. God was here. The course of human history had been changed all the plans that he made, or all the plans they made that were broken and twisted and turned no longer mattered. They were holding God in their arms. The theme of this series is thin places. And a thin place, according to Celtic Christian mystics, is a place where the boundary between the divine world and the human world is more permeable. The place where the heavenly and human can for a moment meet. But in this moment of Jesus' birth, the distance that once existed between God and man no longer existed because God was now here in flesh and bone, born in humble surroundings, born with pain and blood and crying, just like each one of us. I can engage with Jesus' birth because it's an integral part of what I believe, but I can relate to Mary and Joseph's story because I'm a parent. Becoming a parent is a very interesting thing. It's one of those life things that people tell you about that you never really quite understand until you experience it for yourself. And it's not really all that easy to explain. I can explain falling in love with Erica. I can trace the steps from being smitten to infatuation to deeper, friend, deeper relationship to love. And that intellectually all makes sense to me. But when your child is born, there's very little logical sense about it. Here's this person that you have never met before that wasn't in this world a minute ago, 
But then the second they arrive, you, you feel such a tremendous, unconditional, intense love that is unlike anything you have ever felt before. And you feel it for this person you've never even met. I was never worried about how I was going to react when uh, Kalen was born. I just didn't know how I was going to react when Kalen was born. Turns out big, joyful, slobbering, bl uh, uh, sobbing, blubbering mess was uh, what I was in store for. Uh, and I'll say this, I've, I'd say I pretty much have been a Christian my whole life, but it was in that moment when my child was born that I felt my understanding of God, Jesus, and the Christmas story being taken to a completely different place. I was able to hold Kalen in my arms and say, you are good and you are perfect and you are mine and I will love you with all my being for all eternity. And I understood why God became human, why it was worth it all to him. God holds us and he says the same thing to each and every one of us. You are good, you are perfect, you are mine and I will love you with all my being for all eternity. For Eric and I, the frustration of having to, uh, trouble getting pregnant, um, our plans changing every month for about a year while trying to do so, the ups and downs and twists and turns of pregnancy for nine months, it no longer mattered. There was no longer a barrier between the divine world and the human world that day that Kalen was born. Just like heaven literally came to earth, when Jesus was born. You see, I don't need a silly Christmas sweater, a moose mug, or some cheesy songs to get into the Christmas spirit. This is the moment I go back to, to remember and celebrate what Christmas is all about. Every time I hug my daughter, I celebrate Christmas. I feel God's presence, and I experience that thin place where divine touches our world. But Dave, you may say, I do not have a kid. I'm not going to be a parent anytime in the near future. How can I experience the same thing you're talking about? I think there's something that we can do, uh, regardless of whether we're a parent or not, and that is to pray. Pray that we may allow God, uh, that God may allow us to see and love people the way that he does, that the way Jesus does. Remember that everyone you interact with is someone's child. There were parents whose hearts swelled with love when they were born, and God knows and loves them incredibly, even more than their parents do. They have hopes and dreams and hurts and disappointments, and they are made in the image of God who came as a baby named Jesus 2,000 years ago to live and die for them. And I'm willing to bet that some of our families here with small children would love to let you borrow them for the, an evening, maybe experience the cuddles and smiles and laughs of a new human being in this world. And if you do it enough, they will light up when you come into a room. They will say hi, they'll run over and give you a high five or give you a hug. And you can get a small glimpse of the joy of a new life bursting with hope and love. Jesus came not just to be born and to be a baby. Christmas is just the beginning of the story. Jesus came to serve and love and sacrifice. He sees us differently, differently than we see ourselves and how we see others. He looks at us and says, you are good, you are perfect, you are mine, and I will love you for all eternity. And in the same way, I think there are benefits and in the same way that I think there are benefits to viewing the Christmas story with more humanity, we have an opportunity to view our friends and family, our acquaintances and our strangers with a more spiritual significance. This is not our normal human inclination. We need Jesus' help in changing our hearts to accomplish this. We need to pray for God to change our hearts. We need to pray for God's help to view people with the eternal significance that he does so that we can love and hold them the way he does, the way I hold Kalen. If we are able to do this, the effect of this true Christmas feeling, this true Christmas spirit will be felt much longer than through December 25th. 
Remember, Christmas is just the beginning of Jesus' story of redemption, the first dissolution of the division that existed between God and humanity. May we be people who invite Christmas here, not just for one day or for a month or a season, but every day when we encounter everyone that is beloved by God. May we look upon the world, serve the world, and hold it in our arms the way God does, saying, you are good, you are perfect, and I will love you for all eternity. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your son, Jesus. I thank you that you care that much about us uh, and love us that much, that you would become human and experience all the pains and joys and ups and downs of life um, the way that we do. Um, we thank you for Christmas and your love and that we can celebrate this and the true joy of your uh, season and the love of your son, Jesus, and that in this place, in this uh, holiday, and in every day since the first Christmas, that there is no longer that thin place. There is no place but you here with us. Pray this all in your name. Amen.